Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining um, today's event, uh, What's Legal About Cancer? Know Your Disabilities Rights. I'm Alicia Kalamian, a community health educator and outreach core manager with Chicago Check, and I'll be moderating today's discussion along with my fellow colleagues. For those of you who don't know, Chicago Check stands for Chicago Cancer Health Equity Collaborative um, and is a tri-institutional partnership between Northwestern, UIC, and NEIU, and is funded by the National Cancer Institute. Um, we also work closely with various communities community partners. Um, without them, we really couldn't do the work we do. Um, our aim is to support cancer health equity in Chicago through research, training, education, and community engagement. Oops. Oops. <laughs> um, I'd also like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. June McCoy, Professor of Medicine and Geriatrics, Medical Education and Preventative Medicine at Northwestern. Um, lastly, before passing along the floor to our wonderful speaker, I'd like to kindly ask everyone to please keep your audio muted during Dr. McCoy's presentation. There will be time at the end um, to ask her any questions. In the meantime, please feel free to post any questions and or comments in the chat. Um, also, we welcome anybody to share their video if you'd like. Um, please note the event is recorded, so it's whatever you're comfortable with. And with that being said, welcome again, and I will go ahead and pass the floor to Dr. McCoy. And I want to thank Alicia Kalmanian, Kalmanian for this really lovely introduction and, um, and also um, just the entire Chicago Czech family for uh, give me the opportunity to talk with you today. I thought it was important that we make sure that our community partners and anyone else um, listening to this, uh, either listening to or watching this presentation, really understand the struggles that people living with cancer, I don't like saying cancer patients, because uh, these are real, normal, people living with an illness and doing the best they can with that. And so I want to make sure that people living with cancer, people trying to raise their family, uh, families while uh, um, struggling with cancer, and people who are trying to bring normals into their lives understand that support is there for them. And it is uh, this support that really makes me um, really draws me into doing this presentation today. So um, we got recent information, recent uh, cancer statistics from the American Cancer Society that actually leave one really uh, worried. Uh, yes, we know that cancer has, uh, we've seen some improvement in cancer outcomes over the last decade. And we have a lot more cure, a uh, lot more treatment options that being said, um, one continues to worry about uh, ourselves and our families when we look at what's going on in terms of cancer statistics. So I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit and then jump back later on. In 2022, an estimated 1.9 million new cancer cases, and that should have been, were diagnosed in the United States. We just ended the year, so it's still in the, in the future. Uh, tense and 609,000 cancer deaths occurred in 2022. So a lot of people lost their lives to cancer. But what these statistics don't tell you is about the thousands and thousands of people who, are, who have survived cancer, either curatively or through uh, remission, and who are living with the disabilities that came about because of their cancers and what is available to support them as they try to live as normal a life as possible. I'm jumping back because I want to point out that as an academic geriatrician and someone who uh, uh, pursues geriatric oncology research, I can't leave older adults out. And we already know that cancer is a disease more so of aging. Yes, children get cancer, adolescents get cancer and young adults do but it really disproportionately affects those who are 65 and older. And the interesting thing is that approximately 10,000 Americans turn 65 years of age every single day. That's a lot of Americans getting older. 
and cancer incidence increases as we said before with aging. So one in two men and one in three women will get cancer in their lifetimes. And I put this little, um, I call it a, a, a pictorial, so you can get an idea of the impact of aging, not only in terms of cancer, but in terms of cost, in terms of what's marketed, being marketed to people and the influence of a generation of baby boomers on the aging process. These are the baby boomers who are actually, many of whom are actually experiencing cancer. And they are not, I put this here again, because they're not a force to be ignored. They're a force to be reckoned with. Our favorite movie stars, you think about your favorite movie stars, they're all in this age group. Uh, at the, maybe at the earlier, at the lower end, you know, the younger end of the age range, but they are now geriatric patients. And many of them have gotten cancer. Many of the movie stars are living with cancer and even our leaders are living with cancer. We just learned recently that the new director of the National Cancer Institute uh, has breast cancer and she intends to uh, survive that breast cancer. Uh, what disabilities she might have, we don't know, but we wish her, certainly wish her well. I put this um, rather fun uh, uh, um, cartoon to kind of underscore again, just how the population is aging and aging so fantastically. Even for those getting cancer, many are surviving it. Now they're actually considering what should they do? What's the solution to this aging population? No solution because people continue to live longer and longer. As people live longer and longer, cancer care cost goes up. And I mentioned costs and one might wondering what does it have to do with disability? A lot. If you're disabled, you can't work or you have to shift, shift from a full-time job to part-time job as a cancer survivor. There's a cost to that. You're not bringing in the same income that you did before. You still have a mortgage to pay, rent to pay. You still have, if you're younger and you might have children in college. Uh, and so there are lots of those things. And then just a direct cost to you of your treatments, the co-pays uh, for your cancer care um, will add up. In addition, we know for instance, that the cost of these drugs have gone up. So cancer care costs will rise, it's on the rise and has resulted in what we call financial toxicity for a lot of survivors of cancer. It's also been hard on the caregivers who support their very loved ones who have cancer. And so um, we talk about these general things, but we're gonna push into the mix disability, the disabilities people experience after fighting a war against cancer can be quite uh, um, uh, uh, high and the degree can be so deep that um, people end up becoming um, victims of financial toxicity. And we know the studies have shown that, that cancer patients are two and a half times more likely to file bankruptcy than their healthy cohorts or, or um, colleagues. So you'll see that there is certainly a tremendous negative impact on cancer beyond the actual physical disease, beyond the emotional toll, beyond the mental toll that it exerts, beyond the familial tolls on people loving uh, those living with cancer. And uh, this disability um, needs to be addressed and people need to be aware of what's there for them. I don't think many Americans recognize that there are things uh, in place to protect them, to support them as they go through disabilities from cancer. I put this picture up because uh, it is what people think of when they think of disability. Uh, often an old person, in this case, she doesn't have any assistive devices. She has no cane, no walker, um, but she looks to me as if she's a woman who uh, uh, has a purpose. She's on a mission. She's walking, bent over, but walking with a bag and, and maybe she's going off to work, who knows? And this picture, um, I, I like it because people in this age group are a little older, are often still working despite their disability. She's bent over, one might assume that she might have spinal stenosis, tend to make people walk with a bent posture because when they walk straight, their backs will hurt. But I put this here also to say that disability doesn't often 
really look like just this. It looks like other things. It might be a disability that you can't see, a disability that you can't even envision, but that person's disability is causing wreaking havoc on them. I also put the picture here to show that people continue to work because Americans are people who love to work. And new statistics show that the older adults, and I'm not gonna focus this only on older adults, but I wanna point out that older adults are not leaving the workforce. In fact, they're entering the workforce. And if, as we said before, that cancer incidence and even prevalence, the existing cases have gone up because the incidence has gone up so much and people are living longer. So we have prevalent uh, lens in um, data. If we say that prevalence has gone up, incidence has gone up, we say the, the aging population is really living longer. The older population are just living into real old age in the 90s and 100s. And we say cancer is a disease primarily of aging. The burden falls on the older adult. And people are entering rather than leaving the workforce who are older. Then you can see what we're talking about. How do we accommodate those people? The Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA is an important law. It's as important now as it was in 1990 when it was first um, signed into law by President George H.W. Bush. And it really protects civil rights of people with disabilities. We all know the Civil Rights Act and more so it's in our consciousness uh, since we just recently celebrated Martin Luther King Day. And so we know the importance of the Civil Rights Act, but this act was, was, I would say, equally important because it recognized that we have many Americans living with disabilities. And it recognized that America had, has a responsibility, had in 1990 and still has a responsibility to really make sure that those with disabilities can live as good and as a high quality of life as the so-called normal or able-bodied persons can. Uh, the thing to remember as you're going, with, I'm going through these slides is that it applies to employers with 15 or more employees. So if you're if you're if you work for an employer who has only five of you working in this in the after the job, it doesn't apply. And and the provision was put in place this way because they want to make sure that while they're supporting uh, those with disabilities, they're not causing a due, undue hardship to the employer. They want to encourage, the government wants to encourage employers to hire people with disabilities or where someone came in able-bodied to maintain, or I would say retain, it's a better word, retain those who develop disabilities along the way. Like for instance, those who develop cancer and from the cancer, they have a disability. Uh, so 15 or more employees. And um, the, the law was later on updated um, for a reason. We'll talk about why that's important. It went into effect on January the 1st, 2009, the amendment to the act of um, called the amendment of 2008 changed the way the definition of disability had been interpreted. So back in 1990, disability was, Everybody knew it when they saw it, they thought about it, someone in a wheelchair, someone who clearly, you know, they're, they're, they were blind, they had a wh white cane, they could not see where they were going. It, th that was like very easy to see. But, you know, the government was usually slow to come into the, into the, into the future, slow to enter into modern times. Um, we're lobbied and recognize over time that there are many disabilities that you don't see. So the next time you're in a parking lot and someone parks in the so-called disabled person spot, don't be quick to judge them because they walk out and walk out okay. Their disability might be that if they walk too far, they're short of breath. They might have lung problems. They might be someone recovering from lung cancer that's left them with an inability to breathe as normally as, normally as we do. Uh, and so we're talking about the hidden disabilities, the ones that you can't see. The government came to understand that these existed. So the, the, the amendment to the act of 1990 covered disabilities in the mind and the body. It covers disabilities at the cellular level, the immune system, cell growth, 
digestive urinary uh, 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 and central nervous system, respiratory system and reproductive systems. And I think that was, uh, was very important. That was a pivotal change in the law, uh, a seminal change in the law because there are many people with disabilities uh, that cannot be seen at first blush. And they involve our patients that we're gonna, or people that we know living with cancer. Physical or mental problems that limit one or more major life activities is the definition. Physical or mental problems that substantially limit one or more of major life activities. And there, so you have to meet these criteria and there's a record of the person having had such a problem in the past. Okay, so we're looking at not just um, the physical, but there's some documentation, some memorialization of this person's um, problem in the past. And other people think the person has such a problem, even if they do not actually have it. So there is a physical or mental problem, there's a record of the problem, and there's a perception by outsiders looking in that there's a problem going on here. And I start my next slide with work, work, work. Americans love to work. Older adults are entering the workforce in droves, they're not really leaving. Young people, millennials, maybe Generation X, not so much want to work, but middle-aged and older people want to work. And there's this new will to work. They're entering the workforce. And this is an old slide, but it already shows you people entering the workforce. 184,000 up to 366, and that is 20, uh, sorry, 10, about 12, 13 years ago. So we're seeing this increase in women and men and the age range, people are under 65 and those entering their 65 uh, to 69 rate, age range, entering the workforce, there's this will to work. And so with the will to work, the increase in the aging population and the cancer incidence, we can see why that's a perfect storm um, as disabilities uh, emerge from cancer. If you cannot work due to a cancer diagnosis, you may be eligible for financial support. I wanted to read this before I went back to the top of the slide. Work and disability, work and cancer. Now we, we're at the point where we're talking about people who have cancer now and the cancer is affecting their ability to do something that they normally would do as part of their daily activity. You cannot work due to a cancer diagnosis. If you can't, you may be eligible for financial support from social security. A lot of people do not know that, that the law says you can get social security. You can apply for and you qualify in almost all cases um, to get your social security. You can get it under either supplemental security income or so-called SSI. And people all think about SSI when they think about like children with you know learning disability. Yes, it's used for them, but it's also uh, used in the case of cancer disability. You can get it under social security disability insurance. So there are two avenues under which a person with cancer who meets certain criteria can apply for social security as, um, support. Social security has made it very clear if you go to their website, very clear, we support people who are fighting cancer. There's a concept called compassionate allowance. Social Security wants to say, we're here for you. We're like your family. You will see some of the commercials on telly talking about, you know, um, law firms that say, we treat you like family. The government has gotten into that kind of ad mode where they're saying, we're not bad. Even the IRS is trying to say they're compassionate, but definitely Social Security supports people who are fighting cancer and they have put their money where their mouth is and they do support and they do provide um, pretty quick um, benefits to people living with cancer. So simply apply for disability benefits using the standard social security or supplemental security income application. Make sure to go to the social security website, look for the application, complete the application, make sure you've got uh, supporting documents uh, and if you're asked for them, you, you um, will be ready to, to provide those. The website is ssa.gov and um, federal law 
really guarantees that if you qualify, you will get social security. Now, let me kind of go back to the whole thing about the social security um, uh, provisions. Um, they were looking at people with especially stage four cancer, people who have had metastatic cancer, they will qualify rather quickly and will get benefits within about five to six months. Those who are not that um, advanced in terms of cancer, but who have had, and clearly the doctors have documented that there are um, disabilities that have emerged because of their cancer, sometimes because of the cancer treatment, those persons will get their social security benefits in a couple of months. And so I'm gonna correct myself. They'll get theirs in a couple of months, about five, six months. And those who have stage four or worse will get theirs in like 10 days or so. So a correction, much faster if you've got metastatic disease or stage four disease, you can qualify for benefits in 10 days and the others in five months, making it clear. Um, now there are, I wanted to go through, I think I might have missed a slide or have this slide misplaced a bit, but I'll get back to that near the end. Um, so moving on from that, remember there's something called the Family Medical Leave Act. And I mentioned that because I think a lot of people are also not utilizing that act. And in this case, if you're a caregiver listening to this or watching this presentation, you need to be aware of this. You need to be aware that you can get some time off to take your relative with cancer to see a doctor or to go for their chemotherapy or radiation therapy to go and get fitted for a breast prosthetic. Uh, you can take them for physical occupational therapy. You can take them to see that psychologist because uh, almost everyone that I know with cancer goes through a lot of emotional angst. Some people become deeply depressed. Sometimes the cancer itself causes depression. For instance, pancreatic cancer will cause depression. Sometimes years before that cancer is even diagnosed. So cancer can cause depression and just having it and adjusting to having it can cause depression or other mood disorders, including anxiety. And that person may need to see someone. And you know, as I, I talked with a woman earlier today uh, and focused primarily on cancer and uh, underrepresented minorities. And we were talking about um, people going to see their oncologist when they're, when they're diagnosed and then talking with them about treatment options. And we talked about things like shared decision-making and all that. And I mentioned this to say that one thing that I pointed out and with, with, what she, with which she uh, uh, agreed uh, is that sometimes the underrepresented, underrepresented minority um, patients are not out of spite or something you know, deeply willful but are often given decisions, uh, having decisions made for them and given treatment options um, that sometimes turn out to be not the, the right treatment for them. And I mentioned this to say it's important that someone goes with a person with cancer or, a lot, or another life-threatening, potentially life-threatening uh, diagnosis to discuss the plans um, with the doctor involved. And uh, so I mentioned that to say that many times our loved ones want us with them when they're going to their oncology appointments or going for certain treatments. And if you need to take time off work because you're, you have a job, but you know, you, you, you're you torn between your family and your caregiving responsibilities and your job, of course, you're in the middle, you're sandwiched somewhat. The law says you can get time off. Some people will take the time off in you know, periodically in, in weeks, in, in short um, time blocks over uh, uh, up to 12 weeks. Some people will take it in a bigger chunk. Of course, it depends on if the person's having an operation and they need to recuperate at home and someone needs to be with them for maybe two weeks straight. But otherwise people take it off in days or weeks. And the law says you can, you need to be aware of that. That's gonna be important for the survivorship of your family member, but also for you, because you need to also continue your life and you don't want to get emotionally um, 
devastated by taking time off and losing your job when the law says you're protected. So this applies to companies with at least 50 employees. So if you work for a big company with at least 50 employees, you can apply and be granted Family Medical Leave Act. You will need that form to be completed by the primary care doctor or the doctor with whom your, your family member uh, has those visits and they complete a portion of the form and then it, you'll be given instructions as to where to send it and so on and so forth. You still keep your health, health insurance benefits as an employee of that company, although you're on under Family Medical Leave Act protection. You don't lose your own insurance. You don't lose your job. It is protection and it's legal protection. And the good thing is federal law. And whatever your state law might be, it can be more rigid if it wants to be, but it cannot be less rigid um, than federal law. Federal law always under the supremacy clause of the constitution of the United States, federal law trumps all state laws. So the state can give you more benefits if they want, they can't give you less than federal law says. They can't say, oh, it's only 10 weeks or state only gives 10 weeks. No, that can't happen. Moving to quickly to women and cancer. And I'm moving to women and cancer. Uh, not only am I a woman, but uh, we know that uh, when it comes to cancer diagnosis, women are coming in earlier. Some studies show the risk is three in one versus men of getting um, more cancers and that women are really interfacing, interacting with the healthcare system a lot more uh, and coming earlier uh, and so on and so forth. Lots of different reasons. And I felt we should talk about some of the unique issues facing women because it's not only issues of aesthetics with some of their cancers, but certainly issues of literal um, uh, emotional stability, issues of uh, um, function in, in the workplace because of the kind of cancers they might have. And so I thought it was important. So women and cancer. And um, there's this little button that talks about bringing your brave. And I love it. You know, it's got the usual pink button of breast cancer, but it's, 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 it represents how brave women have to be because uh, uh, they, more than men, are affected by a cancer that really changes a lot who they are in terms of their sexuality, in terms of how family and friends view them, society sees them, and also in terms of actually the impact of that particular of treatment on that particular cancer. And we talk about breast cancer here in terms of disability in the workplace. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act or WHCRA, the WICRA. And this is an important federal law. Again, love it that it's federal law. Uh, came about October 21st, 1998. And you can report any, any company or any insurance company that does not give you, um, does not live up to the, the letter of the act. It's being monitored by the US Department of Labor and Health and Human Services Department, both Labor and Health and Human Services Department. And it protects women with breast cancer who choose to have breast reconstruction post mastectomy. So if you're a woman or you're a relative of a woman, if you're a gentleman listening to me and your wife or girlfriend or partner um, has breast cancer and she, her cancer, her oncologist suggested um, mastectomy because either the nature of the cancer or because it might be a recurrent uh, cancer. She might have had a lumpectomy and now it's time for her to have that mastectomy to make sure that she lives on. And she decides, I want reconstruction after mastectomy. Our insurance company cannot deny her that right. And just so you know, they can't just say, well, okay, we will recon we'll pay for the reconstruction of the, the right breast where the cancer was and, and that's it. No, if her doctor says she needs the other breast also operated on to make the breasts equal, they have to cover it. So they can't leave her with one lopsided breast. 
if that woman needs breast reconstruction, she needs to be made as whole as possible. And if it means that she needs to have an implant or something done to the other breast, the insurance company has to cover it. So it's making the woman whole if she wants to have that done. And, it, and by using the term whole, I don't want anyone listening to me with breast cancer, which runs in my family to, to believe that I am saying that you're not whole because you lost the breast or you decided bravely to have a mastectomy. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you, in, if you, if you believe your wholeness and you have a right to it, you have a right to say, I want no mastectomy. I want, I, I want mastectomy. I want no breast reconstruction. But if you want it, whatever you see, you deem whole to be within reason with, in terms of your surgical oncologist who's going to do your breast surgery, then you should get that whole. You should have it. A woman shouldn't have to worry, oh my God. All right, so they're going to do this breast. So I've got a size C cup and now I've got a size D cup. No, 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 no. You get this, the... The, the cup size that's going to be equal that's how it goes so um uh, remember that it is it is um comprehensive and it's um it was fought for and your insurance company will have to cover it remember that pass this on to any woman you know who has had or is contemplating um mastectomy so breast risk reconstruction post mastectomy it's covered Breast reconstruction of the non-involved breast to ensure symmetry and balance is covered. Covered. Thank God nowadays, nowadays we're not having many women with um, post-recent uh, mastectomies having uh, lymphedema because we're doing sentinel node biopsy, just one node. Um, but we have women, again, this is how I talked about breast cancer is not just, well, she lost her breast, so what? No. It's a, it goes really deep. And for the women who have been left with lymphedema, it's painful, it's, it can be debilitating for them. Uh, uh, and so this is a, a cancer that leaves them quite disabled in, 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 in many cases. And again, for women listening to me, I'm not saying that the cancer has taken over who you are. That's why I said, bring your brave on because it's a brave woman um, who is, you know, have to make all these different decisions, whether they're going to do mastectomy or not, whether they're going to have reconstruction or not. It's a brave woman who picks up and goes back to work after these surgeries, who, who picks up and continues on with her family, um, who goes sometimes with pain, who has a uh, a, a job where she has to use her arms a lot and she might have lymphedema. So um, um, the I know men get breast cancer too, but not at any rate that women get it, but it's brave men and women who go back after these, these surgeries. Um, any physical complications um, at all stages of mastectomy, including lymphedema needs to be treated. So if they need to go and see a, a, a lymphedema professional, if they need to have a procedure done, if they need to have acupuncture related to lymphedema, um, if they need to get external breast prosthetics, if they need to get uh, um, special bras uh, uh, um, done, these are all covered. It's a very comprehensive uh, act and, and it's, it's a blessing to American women to have this. And um, I commend the federal government on this particular act. Now, I, I put this here because it's not the clearest uh, 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 cartoon, but it goes to the audacity, I call it, the audacity of politicians to believe that they can block us from coverage of pre-existing conditions. And that was then, and then there was Obamacare. So, you know, they tried, but we persevered. And I'm not going political here, but I'm going Obamacare here. This important federal law signed into law March 23rd, 2010 was important for people living with cancer. 
You know how many people with cancer were scared to death? They went through so much uh, uh, a despair, worried about this, in, this act. And every time there was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an onslaught against the act, every time there was, there was uh, a, a chance that it would be overturned, it, 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 it made uh, women and men living with cancer suffer even more. Yes, there are lots of other illnesses that pre, pre, uh, um, might be pre-existing. Um, I'm not diminishing them, but I'm here talking about cancer. It's what we're talking about today. And every time that act was uh, um, lamblasted and there was a fear, uh, people with cancer thought, oh my God, what's going to happen to me? So it was a joyous and wonderful day when it was passed in terms of the provision that you cannot be refused care due to pre-existing conditions, pre-existing conditions. All plans sold in the new health insurance marketplaces were mandated to cover essential benefits, including cancer screening, cancer treatment, and follow-up care to cancer. That's powerful, that's a law. So, you know, we often, uh, many people, not we, since I'm a lawyer, if I do that, I'd be committing suicide. But many people look at the law as awful, the law is not protecting for many underrepresented and, uh, minorities and marginal people, immigrants and so on. Sometimes the law appears not to be helpful to them, to actually be a hindrance to them. But we have seen where the law can be, if the law is used the way the, I think the, the, the you know, um, leaders uh, from the beginning of our constitutional, or this country from the beginning of the constitution meant them to be, I, I, I think the, the law can be powerful. The law can give the, have the, the law has a teeth that medicine doesn't have. Uh, a lawyer who understands the law and who brings the law to the forefront to help uh, patients or help people in an ethical manner, under an ethical framework, can be a very powerful uh, ally to have. So the law is an ally for people with cancer. And because of this law, um, people living with cancer know that they have rights and they know that they can actually report this to Health and Human Services Department they can report this, um, they can file suit against insurance companies that try to block them, that this law has teeth and there'll be very, very severe punitive damages. They have to cover existing conditions. So no cost cancer screenings and other preventive care. Medicare covers yearly checkup to discuss disease prevent prevention and that's important in cancer. You know, uh, many people are living or survivors of cancer um, will tell you that they're not stopping their yearly checkup. They're still making sure that they're getting what preventive measures they need. Uh, if it means checking, you know, their CA-125 to see what's going on, their CEA uh, uh, levels, the, if it means, you know, getting their yearly mammogram or two yearly mammogram to make sure their breast cancer has not recurred or if they've got BRCA, the BRCA gene, they might be having it done because family history is so strong to make sure that you know, they haven't developed that cancer. They might be getting a colonoscopy every three years until they're clear to make sure that you know, they have no pre-malignant polyps growing, but this is covered. It's covered and it's, covered the, it's covering the people who are gonna help our patients with cancer, help us if we get cancer. Healthcare professionals, you know, who treat pain of cancer, and those who provide supportive care for cancer survivors um, in our different cancer centers across the country and in private cancer practice, um, and it covers patients who participate in clinical trials. So that's an important thing, and I want to just mention a little bit, make a shout out here um, for clinical trials, and encourage those who are listening to us who will be listening or watching the recorded um, presentation that we need to get more community members involved in clinical trials. I know people who survived, who got cured, who are still alive because of clinical trials. There are clinical trials at the National Cancer Institute, 
but there are also clinical trials in all our cancer, comprehensive cancer centers to varying degrees. You just need to ask, contact your comprehensive cancer center and ask, is there a clinical trial that fits my disease? Can I enroll? If you're an older person in your 65, 70s, 80s, uh, we need more older adults in clinical trials. So uh, remember the law protects you as it pertains to clinical trials. And I put this up, it's kind of, you know, let's not bury our heads in the sand. Um, let's be aware of what's going on. Let's recognize that we have legal rights and that we have legal protections under the law. We want more cancer survivors. We have a lot. So dying is prohibited here. You know, when is our time to go? We'll have supportive care. We've got cancer to help us to cross to the next life comfortably. But as long as we can survive, have a good quality of life, go into remission. We know multiple myeloma doesn't have a cure, but you can go into remission for a long time. I have a patient who has been in remission since I was a fellow. And I was the first to pick up that she had multiple myeloma and she's still alive, um, being seen by our wonderful multiple myeloma doctors here at Northwestern. So um, dying is prohibited uh, until it's time for us to die. Let's put it that way. Um, and just um, as we're doing this, just really make sure that we um, talk with our advocates and make sure our advocates know what we want and make sure our advocates understand and know exactly what legal rights are available to us so that when we can't speak for ourselves, they'll speak for us and make sure we get the legal rights we are entitled to um, relevant to our situations and as appropriate for, for us in terms of our best um, interest and in ter terms of our pre-wishes to our family members. Remember that cancer is the third most common reason. Um, adults are awarded disability benefits. And this was a slide that I wanted to do early, but I want to mention it here just as an over um, kind of, you know, underscoring the importance. Third most common reason adults are awarded disability benefits. There are a lot of people with cancer out there with disabilities, a lot. And the Social Security Administration will help. If the cancer is inoperable or unresectable, they'll help. You will qualify for disability. If it's gone to other places, I talked about stage four cancer earlier, they will help. If it's recurred, they will help. As I talked about earlier, compassionate allowance. Benefits will be received in 10 days to five months, depending on the, degree, the, the um, your prognosis and the stage of your cancer, basically. And uh, one thing to remember, you can get it almost proactively. So um, you can get the benefits up to six months before you were first diagnosed. And this is because you might have a cancer like pancreatic cancer that didn't show itself, but it's been brewing and causing you symptoms. So, you know, uh, although you got diagnosed down the road, it's almost like uh, if your child was molested and there's a statute of limitation on rape and this molestation in your state, usually two to three years. If you did not know about that, didn't know that it happened and you later learn uh, uh, and you're older, you can go after that person. The statute will only start tolling when you know. So when you're diagnosed, you can go back to um, the fact that you had it before but you just got this diagnosis and, and the social security will give you benefits six months, up to six months before. Type of cancer, for instance, pancreatic cancer location. The cancer location was such that, you know, we couldn't, um, it couldn't be diagnosed earlier, but it caused you all this disability, couldn't walk, you couldn't move, you couldn't do your daily living. You couldn't, some people, it affected their vision. Once with, 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 um, retinoblastomas, degree of metastasis, those, all those things can be used to get you pro, um, retroactive, beg your pardon, benefits from social security. And one of the last two slides, I wanna mention the three-year rule. If your cancer has been treated and there's no evidence of recurrence for three years, the cancer is considered gone and you're doing well, your disability will end. However, 
if you're cancer, if you were, you've got social security disability benefits and um, or cancer treatment, the three-year rule on the other hand guarantee that you'll be considered disabled for three years, even if your cancer goes into remission. So if you were awarded um, cancer benefits, right? I mean, disability benefits um, for your cancer and you're going to remission after one year of treatment, it doesn't matter, you're gonna get three years of benefits. But if you had three years of benefits and there's no evidence of recurrence after three years are over, then you, you're, you're considered fine, you're not gonna get any more benefits. You, your three years will be up, there's no recurrence, you're good to go. So the three-year rule is something I think that gives a little buffer to people living with cancer. And it's a good thing that the Social Security Administration has done. And then finally, um, the last slide goes to accommodations and disability. And I'm just going to do it broadly in the interest of time, just to point out that employers must offer accommodations. Once they don't cause undue hardship, they must offer accommodations. So... If, you're, if you have cancer, that makes it hard for you to sit down long, uh, I mean, sit for long on the chair you usually sat on before you got your cancer, your, your company has to provide you with ergonomic, uh, 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 a proper ergonomically placed um, um, made chair so that you can have, you're able to actually work and not suffer while you're working. They're, they're supposed to provide you with flex time so that there are days when you don't come into the office, you can stay home and work from home. We have proven that that can happen. The great resignation showed us that. Young people said, I'll work from home. And employer said, well, you know, time to come back. And young people said, forget you, I'm not going back. So the great resignation has shown and God bless the generation X and the millennials because they're setting the tempo that we are not going to work like our grandparents and our parents before us. We are going to have some kind of balance. And I think this balance um, as shown for people with cancer and shown work um, employers, you can provide these kinds of accommodations. A person doesn't have to be in the office every day. You, if you're going to employ people, understand they can become disabled. Cancer can cause disabilities, depending on where the cancer is. It could be affecting their musculoskeletal um, portions of their body so they can't walk as well. You need to provide them accommodations so they can work and be healthy in the workplace. And the government is very serious on that. Again, under the ADA, they have to have at least 15 employees. I put this one up. Um, um, this is um, one of the little bows that the Cancer Legal Resource Center uses. And the Cancer Legal Resource Center um, is located in Los Angeles. I was on their board of directors. Um, their Cancer Legal Resource Center with resources for anyone with cancer legal resources, they have everything you need. But they also have a Disability Rights Institute uh, and, and they form this this kind of um, almost like uh, um, marriage. And so looking at the disability rights for people with cancer, uh, and of course intermixed with that would be legal rights because on the disability rights come legal rights. So this wonderful center um, in Los Angeles uh, it's a, a 501c3 organization, not for profit, and its sole purpose, been around for about 25 years. Sole purpose is to uh, provide support and legal resources to people living with cancer. It's all free. And the people can afford something, they might ask for a donation. They've got some of the best law firms uh, who support them in terms of pro bono work. Uh, I was with them for several years on their board of directors, and I know they do an amazing job. And these are people who are doing it because they believe in what they do and they're committed. And they recognize like we do, we at Chicago Check uh, recognize that uh, it's important that when it comes to cancer, that it has a comprehensive uh, and a collaborative kind of focus, not just research, not just clinicals, but also community engagement 
and provision and direction of people to resources so they can live better lives and live these better lives for longer periods of time with cancer. Thanks for your attention to this presentation. If there are questions, yeah. I think we Thank can you, have... Dr. McCoy. Um, I didn't want to interrupt you while you were kind of going, but I think your slides maybe got paused on the Ob Obamacare um, slide. So I don't know if it says like your screen share is paused at the top of your screen. And if you wanted to just maybe show some of those slides or um, uh, you can also share the slides. Ah, I see. You... Resume share. So can you see it now? Yeah, we if you're comfortable, maybe we could share the slides with folks so they can still oh, have I'm very comfortable with your sharing the slides with folks. Absolutely. So it got paused on Obamacare. So about here. Uh, one more slide, I think. But we can go ahead and share that with and then on the recording, we can make a link available to um, for folks to go back and and revisit that those things. OK, so pre-existing conditions, it would have paused here. I believe so. I just kept talking without slides. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was I didn't catch you soon enough. I apologize to folks on the no, at well. all. Folks, we apologize to you, but these are the slides and we will make sure that you have access to them. Um, so maybe yeah. we can go ahead and segue into if anybody has any questions in the audience, you're welcome to raise your hand, do like the hand function in Zoom, or you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question if you like. So I'll go ahead and take a pause and see if anyone in our audience has any questions. I'm going to assume that the audience understood everything I said. <laughs> Go ahead, Maxon. All right. Um, good afternoon, Dr. McCoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation. Um, is I feel like the the intersection between like the legal systems and healthcare systems are. I mean, those are two systems that are already hard to navigate on a regular day. Um, and then just knowing the different things that you have access to. Um, I feel like that's a big barrier to people knowing, to people being able to use the benefits that they have. So thank you so much for sharing this information. Um, You're welcome. And yeah, I feel like just looking at the qualifications that you have, it's just such a unique experience of um, like, it's a symphony of different things that you've like experienced and you've learned about and all of these things have brought you to where you are now. Um, and so I guess my question was, what are some ways that um, you think people can stay up to date on um, the benefits that they have and like depending on whatever situation it is that they're in or depending on like what healthcare issue it is that they have, um, how do you think they can go about researching um, benefits that they um, can access and different things that can help them out in that situation. You know, a good way to do that is to go to trusted resource um, spaces in the World Wide Web. And a trusted resource with the American Cancer Society, certainly one, uh, they, they tend to have linkages to other trusted resources. And then as it pertains um, and, uh, uh, to the interface of law and medicine, I would say the Disability Legal Resource Center or the Cancer Legal Resource Center because uh, it's totally about cancer. But the American Cancer Society is a great place and the National Cancer Institute um, also updates their webpage and they usually have a lot of information. And uh, while they're not really going to be deeply, um, you know, uh, uh, going into legal issues per se, they do kind of touch upon rights. And in touching on rights, we'll mention certain laws that they believe pertain to what's going on with someone. And, and then just some other uh, places to look at would be certainly comprehensive cancer center websites, certainly look at ours. Uh, I know some others that are, are also quite activist and um, Memorial Sloan Kettering is one of those. Uh, uh, websites where you can find uh, some interesting things and MD Anderson. Uh, those are some kind of activist websites, but I think academic medical centers can be very helpful um, um, that have these uh, comprehensive cancer centers and ACS, I'm just gonna reiterate again, ACS 
uh, 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 the National Cancer Institute, and uh, I am biased towards Cancer Legal Resource Center because while they're in Los Angeles and they do uh, um, talk a lot about California law, they will tell, refer you to resources within your own state because we know state laws can vary um, at times. But all the federal laws will be the same, of course, and will apply equally across the board. Thank you, Dr. McCoy. Valerie, You're welcome. I see you put a question in. Did you want to unmute and ask your question, or I can read it aloud if you'd like? Sure. Um, hi, Dr. McCoy. This How are you? Just, I'm good. This is just wonderful information. Um, I really appreciate it. Very helpful. And I have a question about um, Social Security benefits. If you do not have enough credits in Social Security, um, are you still eligible for disability benefits when you have cancer? Uh huh. You, you, you'll have to get your benefits through Medicaid. Um, so that that was a that's an excellent question because I should have ah. discovered, because you know you have to you have to with social security it's almost like a bank you have to put in to get out and so mm -hmm. it, some people work but like for instance somebody might might have worked as a babysitter and that person did not put into social security because the, um, their employer paid them under the table. That used to happen a lot in the old days. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, especially with immigrants coming to America mm -hmm. and, and only could get jobs that way um, and, uh, and were kind of illegal, illegally in the homes. But um, no, you, they would go through Medicaid. Okay. So that was great because that clarifies things for a lot of people. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You should be my assistant on the present. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Rivera, and I am a cancer survivor. And thank you for this presentation. I have not seen one so detailed in where I have experienced most of those things that you have talked about. Uh, meaning, relations on survivorship. Sorry. Uh, I've gone to. Uh, an interview and felt like I was discriminated because I was wearing a wig from, you know, your own friends just scatting away because they feel it's contagious. But my question is, I had a double mastectomy about 10 years ago, and I've heard and kind of looked at it, uh, done some research where your implants may be, you know, deflating after so many years. Yes. And so um, having Medicaid now, I'm not sure if I'm covered to have them replaced or I don't know how that works. I don't even, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I, that's my worry. <laughs> and so I go to the doctor and I know my own body and I tell them that it's feeling different and they're like, oh, it's, a, it's okay, it's okay, you know? And I feel like sometimes it's because of my insurance. I or think it's, I'm sorry to cut you off. Let me, are you through um, with that? Yeah. May I, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you need your doctor to partner with you again. Oh my goodness. I just talked about that in the interview today. And uh, I talked about it in the context of um, doctors sometimes not listening to patients. Uh, and uh, actually, or you can even ask the question, they already have a hand up because there are several reasons. Again, I don't believe that they're being malignant. I think uh, being rushed, going to the next patient, moving ahead, their brain has left your room. They left your, the, the, their brain left your room five minutes after the visit started. They might be in there, but they're, they're onto the next patient and jotting down things. And so you could test them once by saying something really crazy, not rude, but, you know, just saying something and seeing if you don't get, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds good. You know, it tells you, you you'll see parents and uh, couples do it to each other all the time. Their brain has moved on, it's modern medicine. The brain moves out of the room sometimes five minutes after the, the doctor's brain is gone, five minutes after the patient gets to the room. I think you need your doctor to be a partner with you and it doesn't mean you don't have a good doctor, but you're going to have to sit your, literally sit your doctor down, respect me and say, I'm only here for this reason. I'm having problems with my prosthesis. I need to have, you know, these removed. 
Uh, Medicare will cover it if your doctor gives a medical reason for doing it. It will be covered. It's the same with Medicaid. It's the same way Medicaid covers, um, will cover uh, people, private insurance or Medicaid will cover someone for breast reduction or so-called reduction mammoplasty if they have very bad back pain because their breasts are so big. I know people have had that done. Uh, so Medicaid, will, you just need your doctor. You need to get your doctor to really focus on what you're saying. And if push comes to shove, if you have a way of sending the doctor a note, um, we have my chart here at Northwestern, and I don't know if you're here with us um, or at another institution where you have my chart where you can send a message. So it forces your doctor or your doctor's nurse or PA or NP and nurse practitioners and physician assistants are just amazingly wonderful colleagues of ours and um, to read and draw the attention of that doctor to what's going on. I think that could be a way of doing it because then, it, you know, the person is reading now. They weren't listening to, but at least they're reading. They might take notice. But don't give up on that because Medicaid will pay for this if your doctor supports you. And on that note, I want to add something else. You talked about going to an interview. You know, it's against the law for them to ask you about your medical, ask you medical related questions. So you don't have to tell anyone about your breast cancer or any cancers you have. Um, if, you know, I didn't add that before, but um, if you, if your doc, if your job wants to make an accommodation, now you're talking about interview for position. Again, you don't have to tell me medical history is not their business, mm -hmm. but it, they could ask you things like, can you do any heavy lifting or so on? And you knowing that you have breast cancer might know, well, can I, maybe I can't, or, you know, you can't, but they, they might ask you, and that, that's something I would ask everyone because your job, if your job entails that you lift heavy things, then, then it's right, the right of an employer to ask, can you lift 20 pounds? Mm -hmm. if they're not violating any rules, but if they're asking you questions about your medical history because it, it, uh, with, with, uh, in almost a discriminatory way, and, and again, they shouldn't be asking about your medical history. That's not the, what the job is about. Um, then that's a violation. So uh, you see where I'm getting at? Yes, uh, absolutely. You can I ask some questions that yes. seem medically related, but mm -hmm. it's, the job requires that. You know, yeah. everybody who takes that job has to lift 20 pounds, but they can't be they can't be asking you questions and using it get, using them against you. That is not accepted. That is illegal. So I encourage you, Ms. Rivera, to really uh, talk with your send your doctor a note. Um, if you don't have my chart or some kind of electronic media uh, medium through to send the um, send uh, the message and just say respectful doctor I know Dr. X I know you're very busy and in, uh, in clinic and so I'm sending you this note make it as detailed but as brief as possible attention span is like a Kellogg <laughs> so people that have 20 minutes attention span and just kind of um, explain what's going on I respectfully, I'm feeling ill and I think it's time my prosthesis were please to just talk about the, the symptoms you're having. And okay. I'd like to set an appointment to come back and talk with you. And Thank if not, you. Go, to your, go to your breast surgeon who did your, if, if, the, if, you, if you talk with your primary or your, your, your general oncologist, maybe you can find your breast surgeon and see if that person could be that advocate for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Thank you for that information. You're very welcome. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Dr. McCoy, for all the wonderful information you provided. I know we are a little over time. Um, Dr. McCoy, would you be comfortable if we also shared your, your email address if anyone had any questions? Yes, that's fine. Um, please, if you want me to answer, do not send me the email and then I don't answer in like two or three days and give up. Just send it again. I sometimes need a second reminder, and I'm always on my email. I really am. I appreciate that so much. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us at this wonderful event. Again, thank you so much, Dr. McCoy, for providing all this great information. Um, we'll follow up with some of the details we talked about. Um, we'll also make it available in the description of the recording on, the, on YouTube, so everyone will still be able to find all the details. But thank you so much, and with that, I will let you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a lovely afternoon, everybody, and thanks again for coming. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care.